So today we have Sammy Johar. He has been a great community member, champion and contributor to DVC and our other tools. He led a discussion in one of our most vibrant office hour meetups on what is an experiment last year. And I am excited to have him here uh, round out this year, uh, leading the discussion on running parallel pipelines with DVC and TPI today. He works at Kernel, a company building the world's most valuable brain data models. At the tech rehearsal last week, I learned a lot about the cool things they're doing at Kernel besides the MLOP solution that he's presenting today. So without further ado, I will let Sammy get started. Well, hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Sammy. I, uh... I have to start by fulfilling an obligation to my corporate overlords and informing you that I do not represent Colonel in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I'm just a dude who built some things and wants to talk to you about it. And um, so that's that's item number one. Uh, item number two is this is not going to be a case of me telling you, here is the way you need to do things. Uh, because as I was telling Jen in our in our kind of practice run through this last week, my dream outcome for this meetup would be that uh, someone says, actually, you can delete everything that you just built and use these two tools and they'll solve all your problems. So uh, I really want us to have a discussion and I am most welcome and eager for even your uh, critical feedback and saying, you know, I think that you did this wrong, and I would love, I really would just love to hear that so much. Um, but at the same time, hopefully I can teach you uh, a few things that, or show you a few things you maybe hadn't considered either with using DVC or with using DVC in certain contexts. And the context is really going to be very important, and I'm going to come back to that multiple times. I'd, I'd like to start Again, so I know the context. I'd like to start by getting a sense of the audience here and in terms of what kind of industries you're working in, what your specific roles are, and and, and especially what your infrastructure looks like. Uh, so All right, so it seems like mostly startups. Uh, there is someone who said uh, a larger corporation says, cool. All right, so now similar question, similar um, format. Uh, your specific role, are you a data scientist? Let's make that the clap. Um, are you more on the MLOps engineering side? Let's make that the thumbs up. Are you a pure software engineer? Let's make that the, the, the crying face. And uh, if something other, uh, do the wow and maybe tell me, tell me what you're doing. All right, so lots of MLOps people, a couple data scientists. And Jen, obviously, who is a, a maverick. <laughs> just, uh, um, last one, infrastructure. Uh, this one we can just do with a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up if you have if a large portion of your infrastructure is on prem, and that can include like a hybrid, you know, hybrid cloud solution. All right, cool. So a good, a good, a good um, portion of us here are working with on prem. Uh, the reason I'm asking that is because a lot of what I'm going to talk about now is really, it, it came about because of the constraints of working with on-prem infrastructure. Um, so, uh, you know, we, uh, so I work at a startup called Kernel. Before that, I worked at an AI lab and uh, where we also had some on-prem infrastructure. And um the it, try, we got to the so at at kernel recently we got to the point where um we need to run large pipelines across many many data sets uh, and we needed to do it uh, you know in some reasonable amount of time which means we needed to run things in parallel uh but we uh did not want to pay for the compute of the cloud for reasons um, so let's just say you're in a in a in a, a similar situation where you have on-prem infrastructure that you're using, uh, and you know you for for some for some reason or another you are constrained to using uh, that on-prem infrastructure, and you now you're trying to answer the question, and you love DVC, which I do, um, and you're trying to find the most effective way to run large parallel distributed pipelines on that infrastructure. 
So that's that's uh, just to introduce you to the problem. That's essentially what I was I was trying to. Um, that's the problem I was trying to solve. So. Uh, so to give you some more context about uh, what do I mean by large distributed, you know, pipelines and stuff like that. So, so for that, I have to tell you a little bit about what Kernel does. Um, Kernel is a neuroscience company that uh, produces that we manufacture a product called the Flow. So the Kernel Flow is a is a this very fancy futuristic looking helmet that you put on your head, and it measures uh, brain oxygenation using light using lasers. So if you're familiar with um, other types of neuroimaging, it'd be most similar to fMRI. Uh, which also is me measuring uh, brain oxygenation. Uh, and fMRI uses magnets. Uh, we use lasers. Um, and so that means that uh, a, what a typical data set would look like is, uh, you know, someone who's using a flow might be a neuroscientist conducting a study, right? They're doing some kind of research, either psychological, experimental psychological research or clinical research. Uh, and so you have a participant that comes in to, uh, you know, wherever they're collecting their data. Uh, they sit down, they put the fancy helmet on their head, um, and then they will do some type of task, right? So I'm going to give you an example, a super, super example, a super, super simple type of uh, task that one it commonly does when one is trying to validate neuroimaging hardware, okay? So you sit down. You get into whatever mode, you know, neuroimaging device you're using, and then you go through blocks. Blocks. Your your session, uh, your recording session, will usually be divided up into blocks of certain types. And so you'll go through blocks of tapping fingers on your right hand, and then resting, and then tapping fingers on your left hand, and then resting. And you do that, let's say, ten times for each hand. And what you expect to see, because of the way that uh, the brain is wired, it, we, there is a, a very specific response that you expect to see in the brain. And if you see it, if you don't see it with your, you know, the, this fancy hardware that you're making, something has clearly gone wrong. And if you do see it, then it's a good sign your hardware is working. So that's a, that's a really uh, simple example of, of, a, of a session. Uh, of course, each each participant, uh, each session itself is noisy, and so you might collect, uh, you know, lots and lots of sessions, and you want to see, on average, am I seeing the response I expect? And 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 so that's let's just say that's the problem that we're dealing with now. It's not um, actually no, that's not the the most exciting example I just gave you to to lighten up your imaginations. Uh, I could I could have given you a better one, um, but uh, anyway, I'm going to stick with it now because we're 15 minutes in. So. Um, the thing to know about uh, about uh, the, the data that we record is that it's very very dense. So our our helmet it, it, it can it has up to two thousand uh, over two thousand usable channels of data. Uh, so there's there's lasers and there's detectors and you can make pairings of lasers and detectors and uh, and so you can get up to two thousand usable channels of data that are each recording at a certain uh, you know, frequency and the data that they actually record itself is is a, is a pretty dense uh, signal. Uh, and so uh, across a 10 minute session, the raw data that you're dealing with is on the order of uh, maybe up to 10 gigs for a 10 minute session. OK, so and that's for one participant. Right. So if 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 you're doing what Kernel is trying to do and really just completely change the game in terms of the scale of neuroscience data sets and be and be able to collect you know large amounts of data and use that to to really inform to to make more much more robust uh, you know analyses of the brain than has ever been possible because if you look at a lot of the neuroscience research um you know you have you have data sets that are like ends of 12 uh, you know, or you'll you'll get people that pool data sets and they'll get up to a hundred and they're really, really excited. Or you have government initiatives to get up to a thousand or more that cost millions and millions of dollars and have tons of funding. Uh, like 
you know, just the scale of data in neuroscience is very small because it takes it takes a long time to record each one of these sessions. It takes a lot of people's time and money and all that stuff. So, so if you're trying to do what Colonel's trying to do, and let's say we want to get up to you know a thousand sessions to start, like that's a uh, you know a thing that you know, and each session's raw is ten gigs, right? You're very you're very quickly uh, exhausting the resources of a single you know computer. So this is not something where uh, if you're familiar with DVC and you've been using it. You know, you might be have, might have been using it in a context where you're on your laptop and DVC repro and it's great and it's fun and it's awesome, but you can't do that when you're dealing with 10 terabytes of data, uh, unless you have, you know, a super, super awesome, awesome laptop or you doing everything over network shares and you're dealing with that. So anyway, you know, uh, the scale immediately starts to indicate we need to parallelize this. We need to distribute this compute. Uh, then there's the processing of that data. So that's the raw data it comes in very dense. Uh, but now we want to take this raw data coming in from the hardware and we want to turn that into some something that's actually semantically meaningful to a researcher. So uh, the data that comes in from the hardware is actually we're, met, we're counting photons as they arrive. It's it's super awesome that like this is a thing that we can do. We can count photons as they arrive. And we want to turn that into some estimate of oxygenation in different regions of the brain, which again, if you're familiar with fMRI, that's that's the same thing that they're doing. So because the, as the level of oxygen in the brain changes, it changes how it absorbs light. So it changes how much light you will be able to detect by shining a laser through that region. And so uh, by seeing how the, the changes in in the uh, the photon counts, uh, how those change over time, you can make estimates of of brain oxygenation. And to do so that takes that takes some significant signal processing. There's not just your basic signal processing like all your you know your filtering and your motion correction and all that other stuff. But then there's a math involved in linear algebra and um, it, other approximations of um, photon propagation models and other stuff and it takes it takes time uh, to run that so so that uh, and I'll, I'm going to share my screen here I'm going to be hopping back and forth between uh, sharing screen and not I don't have slides because again I I, I don't I want to talk less so um, I'm, I'm hoping to get through this stuff quickly so this is a diagram of our of our processing pipeline that we've posted in a in a community post um, Hopefully you're seeing it's, uh, you know, we start up here on the left with this raw, um, this, this raw format. That's that super dense, you know, 10 gigs for, for, 10, for 10 minutes of data. Uh, then you just, just reading the raw data and turning that into a useful tensor that you could then, you know, np.load or, you know, a, a, a czar or whatever. Just that might take on the order of five minutes, right? So again, if you're talking about doing a thousand sessions, now you have five thousand minutes just to read from the raw packets that we that we uh, you know recorded. And then there's the the processing. So each one of these blue boxes is a is a, represents a conceptual step in the processing in the signal processing pipeline. So you can see there's there's artifact removal and there's there's all these uh, corrections and and and, and um, uh, motion correction and other stuff. Then there's math happening here. So this this here is math. Uh, then there's then there's motion correction. And then there's this stuff, this other accounting for physiology, and this filtering. So all this stuff has to happen, and that uh, again can take on the order of another five minutes. So now we're up to you know ten thousand minutes to process just to get to our data to the point that we could actually use it to start modeling or doing, you know, whatever our downstream analysis is. And, our, and generally, our downstream analysis in neuroscience is not going to be fancy ML models. Uh, it's going to be very uh, classical, simple, uh, linear models, uh, GLM, if you're familiar with that, other types of statistical analyses that are, that are very well understood and accepted in the neuroscience community. Uh, because if you if you um, if you just think about it, you've invented this fancy new helmet, and now you say, well, I recorded some stuff with my fancy new helmet, 
And I fed it into this really awesome black box neural network. And it told me this about you. Like there, there's there's no part of that chain that you trust at that point. So the blue steps are all the are all the that processing. Uh, so this is what I would call the this is what I'll call the the uh, the signal processing pipeline. Uh, and then there's the analysis that you want to run on top of that. So that's these um, these these purples. So there are different types of analyses that you might want to run, and then they they produce some type of output for our customers. And that's these green boxes here. Um, and the, the, these, I'm not going to get into the details. You don't, trust me, you don't want to know what SNRF is. Like, it's just, you just don't, it's just, just don't. Um, uh, but the, the idea is that we have to process the signal and then we can run some stats on it. And then that we can, that will produce some output, which then we might also want to aggregate over across our thousand sessions, right? And do some uh, some some higher level statistics. So you do what's called group level uh, statistics. Uh, so that that's where you would you know compare two different conditions or compare two different groups of people. Um, so that's you know that's what we're trying to get to. And our end result would be going from the super dense data set on the order of five you know on the order of ten gigs for ten minutes, uh, doing the signal processing, and that reduces it down to something that's on the order of maybe 100 megabytes per 10 minutes, and then running stats on it, and that reduces it down further into something like your, your end statistics per session will be something on the order of one megabyte. Like it's just, it's some descriptive statistics that then you can, you can uh, uh, you know, analyze. That's to give you a sense of, of the problem I was trying to solve, is I need to do this for, you know, hundreds or thousands of sessions, and it needs to complete before the sun explodes. Uh, because we have thing, we all have things to do, and we're trying to change the world. So that's an introduction to the pipeline. I think this might be common in scientific settings, um, where you know something important to consider is that each one of these sessions is valuable. Each uh, so this is we we are operating in a regime where every single session that's recorded is something that we need to report on and, and deliver useful, meaningful results. It's not a case where we can, let's say you're training a, you know, a, a dog cat classifier and you're like, you know what? I don't like this picture of a dog. This dog is weird. It's messing up my classifier. I'm just going to remove it from my data set. I don't like it. That's not something we can do. We can't just remove a session and be like, you know what? The person who spent, you know, an hour getting someone's time and, and you spent an hour recording their data. You know, I, we, we don't really like your session. So we're just going to toss it out. You can't get do that. Um, so so each session is really important. That's that's one of the considerations of of the context that I was working in. Another really important piece of context is that so all all that that processing pipeline. This is something that the, the, it, it's not something that is like there is a, a right answer. Uh, you just ask a neuroscience, you just go, so what's the right way to analyze NIRS data? NIRS is the name of our uh, modality, near infrared uh, spectroscopy. And, the, and they'll say, oh, yeah, you just do X. No, like no one knows in all of the world, no one knows the right way to, uh, to, to turn this data. Like, do you do this motion correction here? Do you do it here? Uh, what's the right way to take out the physiology? And uh, what, what's the, you know, how wide or narrow are your filters? And like, there is no right answer. It's not, uh, you know, with other more, uh, let's say mature modalities, um, there are, there are packages and tools and you can say, oh yeah, I just ran it through FreeSurfer and I used the default segmentation thing and it was done. And uh, that's not the case here. So we are act, you know, we are actively iterating and developing new techniques even for doing this processing pipeline, which takes a long time, right? Uh, even, even when I go in there and yell at people and rewrite things in Numba, it still takes a long time. So uh, you know, so so iterating on this piece is going to be an unavoidable part of the process. It's not that we can just have each session uh, you know, run in the background through the pipeline and then pull the data later because we like we actually need to iterate on this pipeline as part of our process. Each study that we do is an opportunity for us to learn more about what's the right way to do this. And so that's another 
uh, important consideration. And then, then again, the last important consideration about uh, the context that I was working in was, like I said, on-prem infra. So this would be super simple if I could just AWS batch and then parallel jobs, and then it comes back and I'm done, right? But when you're dealing with on, we we have a, a a you know a compute cluster and we're running Kubernetes and we have to share that compute cluster with we can't just we can reserve some capacity for batch jobs, but we're also sharing capacity for people who are launching Jupyter notebooks and doing exploratory data analysis. And so we have to you know size our jobs appropriately and and and. Uh, so that that's a really important part of why I built things the way I did. All right. So now I'm going to talk about the thing that I built. Um, so the thing that I built, I I call it for now. So okay. So it's called Neuromancer because we're a neuroscience company and uh, we're all nerds and you know we've we've all read Neuromancer. So uh, so that's why. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. And share it's uh, there is a there is a public repo. Um, there are actually two public repos. One is the tool itself, and then another one is a, an example repo of how to use the tool, of, or how the tool can be used in in uh, in, a, in a as part of a DBC project. Um, so the tool here, uh, this image kind of demonstrates um, the basic architecture, uh, and so this. Diagram also illustrates uh, all of the things that are all of the constraints that I have to deal with and that I hope you don't have to deal with uh, because I don't like them. Uh, one is we're working with Bitbucket. So that's one thing, which is uh, just a joy. And also our CI CD tool is Jenkins, which again, is just like, wow, OK, this is a thing, I guess. Uh, and just so that I can inflict that punishment on you as well. I actually included a Jenkins file in uh, as part of this uh, repo that that demonstrates a lot of how it can be used. So I'm going to be jumping back and forth between diagrams, maybe showing you a little bit of the Jenkins file, and then some images here that I've collected that show that should help illustrate um, how this thing actually works. Uh, but I'm going to start with the diagram. So this is the workflow. Uh, in mind. Uh, so uh, you're an analyst, you're working on a new study, or you're tweaking a pipeline. Uh, you're, you, so first, you're running things locally. You know, you're testing out some changes on one or two sessions. You know, those you can do pretty easily in, uh, in you know, on your laptop. And then at a certain point, you, you, you feel confident. You're like, okay, I'm ready to run this across all my sessions. So you'll open a PR. Uh, you don't necessarily need any to add any reviewers, but I'm just using PRs here as a way to uh, trigger webhooks to Jenkins. So if in a PR, you make this comment uh, here, it says kernel repro because we're called kernel. You could obviously change the uh, the keyword to whatever you want. Um, and that causes Bitbucket to trigger Jenkins, which then uh, does a few things. One, it builds uh, the Docker image for your for your project. So you can see here, there is a Docker file in this example repo that that has all these things, and you know it. Uh, it a couple, a couple, uh, some things about this Docker file. It might be way more complex than you need, um, or maybe actually there are things in here you're like, ah, that's how I do the thing that I wanted to do. Um, so, for example, if you need to optionally install GPU requirements, there's a section in here because that's a thing we have to do. So I was like, you know what? Uh, this was this was way harder than uh, it needed to be for me to figure out. Let's just make it easier for other people. Uh, there's a production stage and there's a development stage um, because uh, because I strongly believe in doing all your working containers and even when you're working locally. So I always have a dev stage to all of my projects, which uh, which then we use to build dev containers and we do all our work in VS Code. Um, uh, requirements are locked using poetry. So I gave an example of, okay, maybe, you know, you have some basic, uh, your typical scientific computing libraries here. And obviously you're using PyTest and Black and Dev because you need to format your code and, and, uh, and test it very rigorously. Uh, so this is the example repo here. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so oh, make a comment, triggers Jenkins, builds a Docker image. And then that Docker image is used 
to as the as the image in which all of these workers are spawned. And the, the logic of spawning these workers is what is handled by this uh, by this tool that uh, that uh, that we built called Neuromancer. Um, so it spawns a bunch of the pods, and I'll talk about the, the logic of spawning the pods in just a sec. It spawns a bunch of pods. Each pod will work on reproducing the stages for one a session. So uh, uh, there will be many stages. They will look like, uh, so I ex gave some example pipelines here. Another thing about how we commonly work is we have our, our DVC projects usually split up into multiple pipelines just for organizational uh, purposes. Because as you saw in that original diagram, there are lots of steps. There can be many, many steps. And if they were all in one dvc.yaml file, it would just become a headache. And to DVC, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you split it up into one DVC.yaml file or, or multiple, it's all one DAG. So it's just, it's for organizational uh, purposes, it's easier to, to, for us to split them up into uh, multiple uh, pipeline folders. So we have the sessions.yaml file, which, you know, gives us information about all our sessions. These are just random UUIDs. And I said, okay, maybe we have, Maybe we're doing a study where, you know, each participant comes in twice. So we have all these UUIDs and it tells us the participant ID and the session number. And so we have this initial load pipeline, uh, which is going to, you know, for each session, it's going to do this, this loading step. And then, and you don't really need to know what's happening in each of these stages. I just want to demonstrate some of the basic logic. For each session, it's going to do this loading step, and then it's going to do some that signal processing on that one. So we have a lot of this across all of our repos for each sessions do this thing and you know okay so that produces some output there and then we go to this analyze pipeline and analyze uh does you know for each session it's gonna it's gonna do some analysis and then it's gonna aggregate all the analyses gonna, it's gonna produce some metrics and some plots right so this is a a a, the, a super super typical pattern for us across pretty much all of our repos we have a bunch of things that happen for each session, and then we have uh, this, this, you know, these aggregation, one or more aggregation stages that that take the results of each session and produce, uh, you know, plots and metrics. We might also have some of these sessions that for each uh, stages, some of these stages that that produce plots and metrics for each session. But we're we're also usually we really care about this about these uh, this uh, aggregation step. Uh, so, so what you might notice automatically uh, right away is that we have this like map reduce pattern, uh, right? So we're we're mapping across all of our sessions. We're mapping some some sets of of uh, of analysis, some sets of processing, and then we're reducing it in this final aggregation stage. And so that's what you see in this diagram here, right? We're spawning out a bunch of uh, pods, and then we're going to collect the results somehow. And then we're going to run the DVC, the, the final aggregation stage. We we launch a new container that can run all the ag that can run the aggregation stages. And then it reports back to Bitbucket and it reports the results. And I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so that's the high level. That's what's going on here. We have a, we have DVC project with stages that are parameterized over sessions. Uh, and then we want to aggregate, we want to run those all in parallel. And then we want to aggregate the results and and you know push them back to our our project. Uh, so I feel like this is another good point to pause and ask if I uh, if anything's unclear, if I need to um, uh, just from the concept before I get into like looking at code and stuff uh, conceptually, if anything is unclear. I guess I have a minor question, which is it sounds like you're quite opinionated you know like you want people to use dev containers and dev dockers um do you get much pushback for that um there's always so whenever you're introducing that's a, that's a really good question i think that i don't think that there is a right workflow i think that the workflow has to be one that the tool that the team that works well for the team and that the team can accept. I like, you can't, you know, I, you are absolutely right. I am very opinionated. It comes from being Lebanese. 
Um, we just think that we know everything and not just that we know everything, that we pretty much invented everything too. So you're welcome world. <laughs> um, and it, it, so my instinct is usually to come in and, and, and start telling everyone how they need to do things. Uh, and, but you got to really be careful because the, the, the process of, it, of arriving at, a, at the right workflow is itself very important. Like it's, it, it's a path dependent process and you need everyone to buy in at each step. Uh, like, so um, I, luckily uh, things like dev containers, using DVC instead of doing everything in notebooks, they very, very quickly prove their own value. Like you, you only have to spend so much time dealing with broken pip environments before you're like what am i doing what is this and i'm like oh yeah you could just open vs code and click one button and have an environment right and and you just show them that and they're like yeah okay yeah i want i want this and i just i want this um there's only so many times where you can say well i did this thing in a notebook a month ago but i can't reproduce it now and uh oops there's only so many times you can do that before you're like, okay, I'm going to put this in a DVC repo and I'm going to check it into Git and I'm going to be sure that I can, you know, like, so they very quickly prove their value. Uh, those are the things that I'm most, I'm most opinionated on. There are other things that I am right. less opinionated on, but I so, will I mean, still push for. No, go ahead. You're effectively focusing on, on reducing the user experience pain that they already have. And that's how people right. accept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it, exactly. It's it's really just about, yeah, exactly. And that's you you put it well, and that's and that's really how this project came about as well. We were using DVC in the very simplest way to start, and uh, but then we started, you know, we really started ramping up operations and and collecting larger and larger, uh, you know, doing larger and larger studies, and we got to the point where you know we were trying to. Uh, iterate on this on this processing pipelines across many many sessions and uh it you know we had 500 or so sessions in a repo and it just didn't work like you just you couldn't run it you know and again we couldn't uh for reasons uh no not cloud and so we just had to have a solution to to this otherwise the answer was well you can launch a jupyter container on on our on-prem infrastructure and launch this job and just wait three days, you know? So, so that, that could be your solution. Uh, but that obviously was, is not a solution uh, and it would take longer than three days. So, so that's how this, that's how this came about. And uh, actually you just brought up and made me think of another important point. Uh, the, uh, and a very important part of the user experience for me for, for this was that it had to be transparent to the user. I did not want the user to have to think at all about the fact that Jenkins and, and Neuromancer and uh, Terraform Provider Iterative, iter which is the uh, tool that Neuromancer uses, which I'll get into a sec. Uh, I, I, they should not have to know anything about that. All they know is DVC repro instead, well, not just DVC repro, that's actually a, 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 um, a bugbear of mine that people think DVC repro is the only command you need to know. Uh, like, no, there's all, you need to understand the, the things. But they need to know how to use DVC locally to prototype their the pipeline and, and test things out and get the the you know do the basic due diligence first, and then all they have to do after that is open a PR and make this comment and things will be handled. Uh, so transparency to my 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 poor PhD colleagues was a, a very important design uh, consideration here. I have a question about. Uh... I'm just trying to understand the how you orchestrated the whole repository to work with DVC, because the if I think about the actual documentation of DVC, if I go through that, then um, for simple projects, your DVC YAML file will be on the root of your repository, and then there will be that pipeline which will you can run DVC repro, and then it will run if there is a, something change is detected, but there in your repository. I can see there is a pipeline and then you go inside, then there is a load and then there is a DVC YAML file inside of that load, but not in the root. So how DVC knows where is your pipeline is and these things. 
Well, that's a great question. If if someone from DVC wants to hop in and answer that, feel free. But I'll, I'll also take a take a crack at it. It doesn't. It doesn't. It, it like I said before. It really doesn't matter whether you have one DVC.yaml file in the root or you split it up into multiple. DVC will discover the DVC.yaml files and it it builds them all into one DAG. So I we could rewrite this. Uh, we could take this repo and take all these dvc.yaml files and put them in one in the root. And in this case, it would be pretty simple because there's only four stages. In our actual repos, you know, there could be dozens of stages. Um, is that actually true? There could be a dozen stages. Uh, I will say dozens. There could, be, there could be one to two dozens of stages. And so having that all in one, in one pipeline file is just not really manageable. So, so as as far as like the, the the actual commands that you would run, you you uh, you can just do DVC repro and it would it would it would continue to work because like I said, DVC will discover your your DVC.yaml files. But what's nice also is that you can, for example, you can say you can go into this this folder here and to analyze, and you can do DVC repro DVC.yaml, and it'll only do this pipeline, right? Or and its dependencies, like if if. I analyze depends on load, which it does. So that's super nice as well. Like you can split split different branches of your analysis up, and you can have different people working on different parts of your analysis. And you know they can this this person over here is just doing DVC repro DVC.yaml, and it's just doing the the motion correction stuff. And this other person is doing it, and it's just doing the stats. Um, so. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's like in terms of what you actually type in the terminal, it's it's the same thing. You just might, uh, and you don't need to CD into that directory either. You can say you can be in the root of this repo and do DVC repro pipelines and analyze DVC.yaml. It'll also uh, DVC is pretty smart. It'll figure it out. Um, or if you just do DVC repro with no with no with no arguments, it'll just do everything as if it were all in one DVC.yaml file. Yeah, man, I'm behind. I am behind where I wanted to be at this point. No, uh, there's not going to be any time for everyone to tell me how wrong I am about things. <laughs> this is not good. Um, okay, but that was a great question. Thank you. Uh, and if anyone else has uh, types of questions like that, just like, how do I do this thing with DVC or whatnot? Uh, please, please ask it. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, what this logic here happens and the, the, what's inside this Neuromancer box. So Neuromancer wraps uh, Terraform Provider Iterative, uh, which is this great tool that, that Iterative has provided for Terraform. Uh, and we use uh, a custom, so I have a, I have a fork of this, uh, which hopefully will all the features will eventually get merged upstream, but there are some Kubernetes specific stuff that we needed that are not yet in the, this base Terraform provider iterative. And so it, our, ter, uh, the Neuromancer uses a, a fork of that. Um, and, and what that does is I can show you here. So there, there are two, really two pieces. There's, like I said, there's a map reduce right pattern that's happening here. So there is the map step and then there's the reduce step. Uh, and so I, I, I call those a queue and, and repro, which uh, for for reasons I don't I don't know I could have called them map and reduce I guess. So so queue is the first. This is the first part. This is the part that actually plans and runs the the, the jobs across uh, the DVC pipelines. Um, so this is this is the Python code, but it's a CLI tool. You just you call wintermute uh, on the. Uh, on the command line, which is what the Jenkins job does here. Uh, da, 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 but yeah, Jenkins, no, sorry. Uh, Jenkins file, so you can see here, it, it to launch the workers, it calls winter mute and it passes a bunch of arguments. And so, so some of the stuff that might be specific to Kubernetes is things like you want to mount a certain file share that you have on-prem, uh, that's an important piece. Uh, you might need to specify some, some node selectors. You might need to specify the, the storage class of your of your a stair, a short shared storage. You might want to add some tags to your pods. If you don't know what any of that is, it's fine. Is that that's for the MLOps people? Let them worry about it. 
uh, but that's that's built into to winter mute uh, and which is again that's the name of the of the command that that does this scheduling uh, so what winter mute does is it goes through your DVC pipeline and it finds all the stages that are parameterized over sessions and it starts building a work list okay so uh, here you can see an, uh, an, uh, examples of each of the different conditions. So you can uh, you, you so you can see here it's saying okay I'm going to add this uh, this session here this this stage FALF time varying don't have to know what that is it's a neuroscience thing um, this stage is parameterized over a session so I'm going to add it to the work list of the worker that's working on session two F two E blah 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 blah. Uh, this stage here is not parameterized over sessions. This is a reduce. This is a reduced stage. So I'm not going to add it to anyone's work list. Right. Same thing here. Same thing here. Same thing here. And then also at the bottom here, you can see it says um, this pipeline is actually not in the list of pipelines that I was asked to reproduce. So I'm going to skip it. Right. So it, pr it puts together a work list where a work list is session ID. And uh, and and then here are all the stages that I want you to reproduce. So that's the work list that uh, that this thing. Uh, that's the first thing it does is it puts together the work list. Uh, so that's here. Get session stages. It's going through. It's getting all the stages, and then it puts together a Terraform uh, file, which is what TPI. Is. So you know, it's TPI is the first T is for Terraform. So we're using Terraform here. Uh, puts together a, a, a the, the, J, the JSON for Terraform using all the arguments that you've provided. If you have any tags, it's, it'll add those. It tells the script that it's going to run inside each pod is Neuromancer. And so I'll talk about that next. Uh, you know, you can specify your machine size, what Docker image are you going to use? That's the one that we just built in the first step. Uh, this, this is another example of things that we I needed to add to TPI to get it to work is you let's say you have 500 sessions, but you cannot afford to spawn 500 pods, right? You that, that's that's you you don't have that much compute. Maybe you can afford to spawn 10 pods or a, or you know 50 pods or three. I don't know what your compute cluster looks like. Uh, so that's completions is how many jobs do I need to do? And parallelism is how many workers do I have to complete all those jobs? And that's not something that you can currently control independently with TPI. Uh, we, there was a PR, there was some back and forth. I think we'll get it in there. Um, so that's that. There's the shared storage directory, which is what's used to send the work list over to the workers. And uh, and then it, it you know makes this TPI, it makes this, uh, the, the, the Terraform file and then ru ru runs Terraform apply. Okay, so that's that's this that's this step. That's how the jobs are launched. Okay, so then each job, uh, like I like I showed you here, each job is running uh, Neuromancer. The command it's actually running anyway. I don't need to show you. I already showed you the command it's running is Neuromancer. And so the first step of that of that uh, job. Here you can see these are example logs coming out of one of the workers. So it says so. It, so it uses oh another thing that it uses and the reason uh, that um, one of the reasons that we went back and forth on the PR is that it uses this environment variable which is provided automatically by Kubernetes uh, when you uh, when you when you launch a certain type of parallel job. And so that's how each worker knows which item off the work list it's supposed to be. So each, so this, this is a nice piece of abstraction that, that Kubernetes automatically provided. I don't have to figure out how to assign pods to things. It's just, it's just an environment variable that's there. Uh, so, so the, uh, the worker will, will say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm worker number seven. I'm supposed to work on item number seven. So it reads the work list, it finds the session ID, here are the list of oops the list of uh, stages that that are on the work list that it's supposed to repro. So you can see here these are what I need to reproduce, and then uh, so that's the list. It it clones the directory. You know here's some debug. It's it, it spit out its config, uh, and then it's uh, so it you know does a checkout from a shared from the, your shared cache. 
and then uh, and then it starts reproducing. So that's the first thing Neuromancer does: reads the work list, uh, you know, clones the repo, checks it out, and then it'll go through each worker's going through. It's running its thing. Each each worker is just running DVC repo, right? That's all. That's pretty much. That's like it's most of it is what it's doing. It's just running DVC repo. So this is an example output that. Um, uh, Wintermute, the, the the orchestrator is like monitoring the logs, uh, also provided by TPI. Although once it goes for too long, it'll it, it you have to stop monitoring the logs because there's too many logs and it will overflow Kubernetes uh, things. Anyway, uh, so each worker will be spitting out the you know the running DVC repo on the stages it was told to, and then you can see here it completed. Oh look, I reproduced uh, you know I reproduced the stages that you asked, and then it'll push it'll push things to the shared cache. It will prepare a dvc.lock file that has the changes just to the stages that it reproduced, right? So it says here are all the changes to dvc.lock for the stages that I was responsible for, right? And since dvc.lock is just a YAML file, that's very very simple to just grab things and merge things in. Uh, maybe this is something where on a, the, someone on the iterative team will be like, no, don't do that. I do this all the time. I'm, I'm, you know, manually manipulating dvc.lock files um, all over the place. And then it's done. Sammy, so that, we, have, we have a question in the, uh, in the chat. It says, can you show again how you specify the user's dependencies in the DVC pipeline stages? Yeah, sorry. Um, um, so basically you said that each job will know which users to pull, like each stage is going to be associated with specific users, right? So I'm not how... sure what you mean by users. Well, in your jobs right now, when it's doing the map, it's, um, it, it, it pulls only a subset of, of the data, right? Also yes. only subs so yeah. do you mean so, do you mean sessions? Are you yeah, talking sorry, about my bad. I'm yeah, I wanted to say okay. sessions. Now now you. now I'm following you. Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. So uh so so then your your question is how does it know which which sessions? Yeah. So my question was basically could you show again where do you specify the session dependencies and the um DVC um steps? Yeah, so here. Uh, each we we do this uh, across a lot of our stages. We have this for each sessions, right? Okay. Okay. Got um, it. So that that marks a stage as being parameterized. And then if you want to, if you want to, if we can take a quick peek at the code here. Uh, -da -da, for each. Yeah. So when it's inspecting the stages. And the way that we get the stages is we just we build a DVC repo object here, mm -hmm. and then we just iterate over the list of stages that are in the uh, DVC repo, and then we can DVC tell the the stage data itself says, oh, do I have this uh, for each? Am I okay. parameterized? And a, an, an important piece of logic that we have baked in is that we're only parameterizing over sessions. So if you're parameterized over other things. That's not included in the in this in these stages that are mapped out, and that's very specific to kernel, uh, and that's something that could be easily changed as a you know as a uh, an option that we could pass in on the on the command line. Just change what's the keyword, what are our accepted uh, values of the for each, um, if it's different for your use case. Awesome, thank you, and sorry for the confusion. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Words, words are hard. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so that's 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 how that works there. Okay, I'm going to do super abbreviated version of the rest because I've been talking for an hour and I I hate the sound of my own voice. So uh, so the workers save their lock files here and they push to cache. Went, uh, then the the orchestrator comes back and it reads all those individual lock files that were prepared by each of the workers. You can see here reading lock from here. It determines uh, how to merge them back into the main uh, dvc.lock file of the repo, and it does that. And then, so now, now you've taken all those individual stages, you've put them, you put, you've updated your base dvc.lock with all the stages, and then it'll, and then it'll commit and push them, which is what happens. Uh, so here, uh, da -da -da. so at the end of winter mute. 
Uh, you see, it, it, it checks, okay, is there anything to commit? If so, I'm gonna commit this and there you go. And it pushes it back to Bitbucket. So that's what happens right here at the end after, after winter mute completes. And then we need to run the reduce stage. So the reduce stage is, is happening here. We spawn a new pod, again, using that same image that we built before. And we're gonna do DVC pull, DVC checkout, and then DVC repro. And of course, since we're logging things, uh, we have an ML flow tracking URI here. Maybe you have that as part of your, of your uh, pipeline. If you wanna learn more about logging to ML flow with DVC in a way that is not completely annoying and makes you instrument all your code, uh, refer back to my last office hours where I talked about uh, how to do that and also has an example repo that you can go through. In that case, I was talking about weights and biases, but it's exactly the same thing. We just have a, a stage in our pipelines called experiment. That's entire purpose is just read metrics and artifacts and send them to whatever my experiment logging framework is. Uh, when I um, We haven't yet ex really explored uh, DVC Studio, so my apologies to the iterative. I'm not trying to steal your business. I'm just saying that that's a thing you can do. You don't have to use, um, if, you, if you're interested in using MLflow or other tracking tools, but you really, like me, do not like instrumenting all your code with every single you know, uh, tool that they want, you can just separate it out into a separate stage. And again, refer back to the other uh, office hours for that. So DVC pull, DVC checkout, DVC repro. So this is now going to run all the reduce stages. And because DVC is smart and caching is a thing, uh, you know, so, okay, that's what I already showed. Um, oh, I didn't, I didn't grab a piece of logs for this bit, uh, but it's going to, so it's going to see, because we've already reproduced all those parameterized sessions, stages over sessions, it's just going to say, this has not changed, skip, this has not changed, skip, this is, so all of your stages that you parameterized over and that the workers worked on are just going to be completely skipped in this here natively by DVC because DVC is smart. And it's just going to run all the stages that are not parameterized over sessions, which is great because in our in our pattern, that's exactly what we want. We want it to run the reproduce stages. Then it runs this diff report. So diff report is just, okay, you did your thing. What is the result? So you can, if you if your repo, if your project registers a, a script called diff report, it'll run it. And then that'll report back to, uh, your your PR with okay here are the results and you know it can show you the metrics that have changed and it can show you plots that have changed and stuff like that. So that's the workflow from end to end, which covers this this last bit here. There's the collecting of results, which I showed you, merging the DVC.log files. Then you launch a new container and run DVC repro, and then you report back your results to Bitbucket, and that's that final line there. And I have no more words to say. Commit and push. There we go. And send out the diff report. Awesome. Okay. I'm done. I'm done with words. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everybody, for being so verbose. I, I want to hear your words now, please. Yes. If you if you have time. Santiago, were you gonna say something? Yeah, um, do you think it's uh, feasible to um, make this same a pipeline, um, but instead of in Jenkins, in uh, Google, Google Cloud Build. In, in what? In Google Cloud Build uh, for uh, the Google Cloud. Oh, has, Google uh, Cloud Build. Yes, yeah. I'm 100% I'm sure that you can do it in whatever CI CD tool uh, you're using. Uh, because if you look at the Jenkins file here, you can see it. it so, the Jenkins, part of why I hope you're not using Jenkins is because this Jenkins file looks awful and it's doing stuff that's so simple. And that's part of why I hate Jenkins. Um, so, but, you know, it's just doing Git checkout. It's doing some basic DVC, you know, setup. It's, it's building a Docker image and uh, then running a container. So, as long as your CI CD tool is integrated with your compute environment, there, there's one constraint, which is that wherever you, this stage is being run, wherever winter mute is being run, has to have access to the, Kuber the, the Kubernetes socket, right? So it has to, it has to be able to deploy and monitor Kubernetes jobs. 
Um, as long as that's true and your CI CD tool can, and that's going to be mostly up to your, you know, your infra team to make sure that permissions and all that have been worked out appropriately. As long as that's true, you can use whatever CI CD tool you want. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but just the the wherever you're running this needs to be able to talk to the Kubernetes uh, through. So Winterm uses TPI, which uh, you know then talks to the Kubernetes socket using the using the under the hood. I think it's the uh, Rust uh, Kubernetes uh, SDK. So as long as that works, as long as you have access to the Kubernetes socket, um, then everything yeah. else should work. Actually, that should be a little bit easier because as you are inside Google Cloud already, you usually have all the permissions easy to put to. Yeah. Uh, so. That's great. Yeah. Uh, if if you do end up building that, oh yeah, go. Sorry, not Rust. Uh, sorry about that. Um, if if you do end up building that, love to see it. Okay. Cool. Yeah, us too. You can share it here on the meetup. <laughs> So anyone have any more questions for Sammy or other ideas on how to solve these problems that are very complex? Yeah, if 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 you have, you know, suggestions of have you considered this tool or we did a similar thing and we were able to do it using that. Again, please tell me all the things I did wrong. Hi Sam, um Giuseppe here. I wanted to ask you questions about uh, the DVC cache. Uh, between the different uh, workers you have? Um, do they share the cache or um, how does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. So to answer that, I'm going to refer back to uh, the DVC docs. Um, so we use a pattern here that is uh, demonstrated in the DVC docs. And, uh, yeah, here's the Jenkins file. So that's shown here. Uh, winter mute, you can see that, I, that we mapped uh, we we mount in to each worker. We mount in the shared cache. So part of what what part of what the orchestrator does is it pulls. For, okay, great, it's back. Uh, so docs, yeah, use cases. There's this. Uh, actually, is it under use cases? Uh, user guide. Where is it? Hold on. Da, 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 da. Ah, shared development. Yes, there we go. So. You do something like this. Uh, you have your your wherever you're do stare at share, share, storing your remote cache. Uh, when you start the job, we can pull the the cache to a shared location like NFS that you need for running your job, and then all your pods can can share access to that. Uh, you know, mount. That's what this this mount is doing, right? Is so that. All of the workers can share access to this to this uh, shared cache. You could have each worker separately, you know, pull its own cache, but then you you'd probably end up with you know du duplication of data a whole bunch, and that just seems um, unnecessary. But also, what what using this shared cache for this step is means that you don't have to really do a pull here. You just need to do a checkout in the reduce step. And it automatically, the, the reduce step automatically has access to all of the cache and the run cache and everything of from all the workers. So it's it's just a, it's a really nice way to to just speed up execution. And then when you're done with the job, you know, you do your push back to your remote and you can clean up the, the shared cache. You know, you can just you can just drop it. Uh, so we don't drop it. We actually have a, a more persistent um, shared cache here, this middle one. Uh, but that's that's what that's essentially what we're doing is we're following this pattern. This was really cool, Sammy. It's I think it's I was telling you this in the tech rehearsal when we were talking about it, like showing the possibilities for other people is, I think, really helpful to everybody to like wrap their heads around what they can do, even though it's very clear that all this is super complicated and it applies in certain ways to certain types of domains with what you're working to. And then you have to like abstract and think like how that is going to work for us over here. But to see the possibilities of what you can do and the flexibility, I think is, is super helpful to the community. So I really appreciate you sharing all this that you have worked on today. Uh, it was super excellent. Team, Casper's still here. Oded, you're here. I think Dave had to go, but um, do you guys have anything to share? I just I just wanted to say one last thing. If, if there are any uh, non-iterative people left on the call, 
Um, I just really wanted to stress uh, that, again, I am not saying you should build your thing like this because my thing was built to, to meet very specific requirements and those requirements may or may not hold for you. Uh, and so there are various pieces that maybe you can throw out, like like oh, you can use a Google Cloud build instead of Jenkins, or uh, you know maybe you're uh, you're not as constrained on your compute, and so you don't need certain things. Like really suiting it. This is something that I, I hope can be useful in a wide variety of contexts. But I am not at all saying this is the right way to do it. And I hope over time, in fact, that a lot of this code can just get deleted as more and more of uh, this functionality gets built into DBC itself. Um, uh, that would be that would be awesome. Cool. Well, I guess we'll end there. Thank you. Oh, Oda, did you want to say something? Please share. No, I just wanted to say thank you, Sammy. I think even though there's a lot of like implementation specific choices there, you, like you said, you had a lot of restrictions and constraints that you had to work with like Jenkins. Uh, but I think that given all of that, there's a lot of very like good fundamentals that you've implemented here, like bringing, you know, like mounting the storage into the workers instead of moving too much data around and stuff like that. So I, I thought it was a really like unique and uh, creative usage of the resources you had and the constraints you had. Thank you. Thank you. Very cool. Anything else? If I could just plant one idea in the in the in the iterative team, um, there's so a lot of the logic of of Neuromancer is is currently um, is in this this like workless preparation and then job serialization and how do you send that over to your workers? I think that's something that uh, is probably already handled by DVC now, considering how we how you guys have added the. Um, the salary worker if for parallel execution. So job serialization and sending over things to workers in as minimal and compact a form as possible. When I started working on this was not easy. Um, like I, I've, I have hacked my way around using experiments to run things in parallel, but that tries to do a lot of things with data, especially that makes it really, really heavy. Um, so uh, as you can see, I'm not at all uh, averse to using the DVC Python, uh, you know, library itself to accomplish things. And if there is an easy way to get access to a, to serialize a job, I think that would go a long way uh, towards, you know, just reducing a lot of, of code. Um, but also, you know, just consider uh, considering how uh, DVC machine and stuff like that are there, how much of this is maybe something that it's very, very simple. It's like a few hundred lines of code that could be, you know, baked into DVC itself. And a user could just say, okay, here are my machines. You know, I could do a DVC config of something. Here's my, you know, access. Just run the jobs. Just go do the things for me. So I'll plant some ideas there. We're, we're getting there. We're working on them. <laughs> we have a lot of roadmap. <laughs> Uh, and prioritizing yes. is hard for all teams right now, but it's definitely on our radar and we know it. So that's really cool. Uh, thank you so much for sharing today, Sammy. This was very helpful, I think, for all of us to see like what our users go through and how they invent and make solutions with our tools. And that's very, very helpful to us and very helpful to the other people that see this. So thank you very much. And this is the last one of the year. I wanted to say thank you all for being here today and being members of our community. Have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, we have a January meetup. It's going to be Francesco Calcavecchia talking about um, his work on GTO, helping make that better and how he's using it. Also, he's faced with some legacy issues and that's why it was super helpful uh, to use GTO for him uh, to create a model registry. So you may wanna come back for that one. And with that, have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you all so much for being here and thanks again, Sammy. Awesome work.